Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read a lightly edited version of The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley published in 1826. The book will be read in order, so if you would like to begin at the beginning, please start with Season 4, Episode 54. A quick content warning. This book contains occasional references to plague, pestilence, death, suicidal thoughts and actions, and in one section, brief descriptions of war and pillaging. We will try to include specific warnings in the episode descriptions, but if you prefer to avoid these topics altogether, we recommend re-listening to our previous seasons or rejoining us for our next book. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Exploration Dreamland. If you have a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, it would help other listeners find us. You can also hear our episodes on YouTube. If you are listening there, please like our episodes and leave a comment for us. We'd love to hear from you. Now... Take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes, snuggle into your sleeping space, and listen to tonight's tale. Chapter 8 We had now reached Switzerland, so long the final mark and aim of our exertions. We had looked, I know not wherefore, with hope and pleasing expectation on her congregation of hills and snowy crags, and opened our bosoms with renewed spirits to the icy bees, which even at midsummer used to come from the northern glacier laden with cold. Yet how could we nourish expectation of relief? Like our native England, and the vast extent of fertile France, this mountain-embowered land was desolate of its inhabitants. Nor bleak mountain top, nor snow-nourished rivulet, not the ice-laden bees, nor thunder, the tamer of contagion, had preserved them. Why, therefore, should we claim exemption? Who was there, indeed, to save? What troop had we brought fit to stand at bay and combat with the conqueror? We were a failing remnant, tamed to mere submission to the coming blow. A train half dead, through fear of death. A hopeless, unresisting, almost reckless crew, which, in the tossed bark of life, had given up all pilotage and resigned themselves to the destructive force of ungoverned winds. Like a few furrows of unreaped corn which, left standing on a wide field after the rest is gathered to the garner, are swiftly borne down by the winter storm. Like a few straggling swallows which, remaining after their fellows had, on the first unkind breath of passing autumn, migrated to genial climes, were struck to earth by the first frost of November. Like a stray sheep that wanders over the sleet-beaten hillside while the flock is in the pen and dies before morning dawn. Like a cloud, like one of many that were spread in impenetrable woof over the sky, which, when the shepherd north has driven its companions to drink Antipodean noon, 
fades and dissolves in the clear ether, such were we. We left the fair margin of the beauteous lake of Geneva and entered the alpine ravines, tracing to its source the brawling Arve through the rock-bound valley of Servoz, beside the mighty waterfalls and under the shadow of the inaccessible mountains we traveled on. While the luxuriant walnut tree gave place to the dark pine, whose musical branches swung in the wind, and whose upright forms had braved a thousand storms, till the verdant sod, the flowery dell, and shrubbery hill were exchanged for the sky-piercing, untrodden, seedless rock, quote, the bones of the world, waiting to be clothed with everything necessary to give life and beauty, end quote from Mary Wollstonecraft's Letters from Norway. Strange that we should seek shelter here. Surely if, in those countries where earth was wont, like a tender mother, to nourish her children, we had found her a destroyer, we need not seek it here, where, stricken by keen penury, she seems to shudder through her stony veins. Nor were we mistaken in our conjecture. We vainly sought the vast and ever-moving glaciers of Chamonix, rifts of pendant ice, seas of congelated waters, the leafless groves of tempest-battered pines, dells, mere paths for the loud avalanche, and hilltops, the resort of thunderstorms. Pestilence reigned paramount even here. By the time that day and night, like twin sisters of equal growth, shared equally their dominion over the hours, one by one, beneath the ice caves, beside the waters springing from the thawed snows of a thousand winters, another and yet another of the remnant of the race of man closed their eyes forever to the light. Yet we were not quite wrong in seeking a scene like this, whereon to close the drama. Nature, true to the last, consoled us in the very heart of misery. Sublime grandeur of outward objects soothed our hapless hearts and were in harmony with our desolation. Many sorrows have befallen man during his checkered course, and many a woe-stricken mourner has found himself sole survivor among many. Our misery took its majestic shape and coloring from the vast ruin that accompanied and made one with it. Thus, on lovely earth, many a dark ravine contains a brawling stream, shadowed by romantic rocks, threaded by mossy paths, but all, except this, wanted the mighty background, the towering Alps, whose snowy capes, or bared ridges, lifted us from our dull mortal abode to the palaces of nature's own. This solemn harmony of event and situation regulated our feelings and gave, as it were, fitting costume to our last act. Majestic gloom and tragic pomp attended the decease of wretched humanity. The funeral procession of monarchs of old was transcended by our splendid shows. Near the sources of the Arvron, we performed the rites for four only accepted, the last of the species. Adrian and I, leaving Clara and Evelyn wrapped in peaceful, unobserving slumber, carried the body to this desolate spot and placed it in those caves of ice beneath the glacier which rive and split with the slightest sound and bring destruction on those within the clefts. No bird or beast of prey could here profane the frozen form. So with hushed steps and in silence, we placed the dead on a bier of ice, and then, departing, stood on the rocky platform beside the river springs. All hushed as we had been, 
The very striking of the air with our persons had sufficed to disturb the repose of this thawless region, and we had hardly left the cavern before vast blocks of ice, detaching themselves from the roof, fell and covered the human image we had deposited within. We had chosen a fair moonlight night, but our journey thither had been long, and the crescent sank behind the western heights by the time we had accomplished our purpose. The snowy mountains and blue glaciers shone in their own light. The rugged and abrupt ravine, which formed one side of Mont Anvers, was opposite to us, the glacier at our side. At our feet, Arvron, white and foaming, dashed over the pointed rocks that jutted into it, and, with whirring spray and ceaseless roar, disturbed the stilly night. Yellow lightnings played around the vast dome of Mont Blanc, silent as the snow-clad rock they illuminated. All was bare, wild, and sublime, while the singing of the pines in melodious murmurings added a gentle interest to the rough magnificence. Now the writhing and fall of icy rocks clave the air. Now the thunder of the avalanche burst on our ears. In countries whose features are of less magnitude, nature betrays her living powers in the foliage of the trees, in the growth of herbage, in the soft purling of meandering streams. Here, endowed with giant attributes, the torrent, the thunderstorm, and the flow of massive waters display her activity. Such the churchyard, such the requiem, such the eternal congregation that waited on our companion's funeral. Nor was it the human form alone which we had placed in this eternal sepulchre, whose obsequies we now celebrated. With this last victim, plague vanished from the earth. Death had never wanted weapons wherewith to destroy life, and we, few and weak as we had become, were still exposed to every other shaft with which his full quiver teemed. But pestilence was absent from among them. For seven years it had had full sway upon earth. She had trod every nook of our spacious globe. She had mingled with the atmosphere, which as a cloak enwraps all our fellow creatures. The human inhabitants had been vanquished and destroyed by her. Her barbarous tyranny came to its close here in the rocky vale of Chamonix. Still recurring scenes of misery and pain, the fruits of this distemper, made no more part of our lives, the word plague no longer rung in our ears, the aspect of plague incarnate in the human countenance no longer appeared before our eyes. From this moment I saw plague no more. She abdicated her throne and despoiled herself of her imperial scepter among the ice rocks that surrounded us. She left solitude and silence co-heirs of her kingdom. My present feelings are so mingled with the past that I cannot say whether the knowledge of this change visited us as we stood on this sterile spot. It seems to me that it did, that a cloud seemed to pass from over us, that a weight was taken from the air, that henceforth we breathed more freely and raised our heads with some portion of former liberty. Yet we did not hope. We were impressed by the sentiment that our race was run, but that plague would not be our destroyer. The coming time was as a mighty river down which a charmed boat is driven, whose mortal steersman knows that the obvious peril is not the one he needs fear, yet that danger is nigh, and who floats awestruck under beetling precipices, 
through the dark and turbid waters, seeing in the distance yet stranger and ruder shapes, towards which he is irresistibly impelled. What would become of us? Oh, for some Delphic oracle or Pythian maid to utter the secrets of futurity. Oh, for some Oedipus to solve the riddle of the cruel sphinx. Such Oedipus was I to be, not divining a word's juggle, but whose agonizing pangs and sorrow-tainted life were to be the engines wherewith to lay bare the secrets of destiny and reveal the meaning of the enigma whose explanation closed the history of the human race. Dim fancies akin to these haunted our minds and instilled feelings not unallied to pleasure as we stood beside this silent tomb of nature, reared by these lifeless mountains above her living veins, choking her vital principle. Thus are we left, said Adrian, two melancholy blasted trees where once a forest waved. We are left to mourn and pine and die. Yet even now we have our duties which we must string ourselves to fulfill. The duty of bestowing pleasure where we can, and by force of love, irradiating with rainbow hues the tempest of grief. Nor will I repine if in this extremity we preserve what we now possess. Something tells me, Verney, that we need no longer dread our cruel enemy and I cling with delight to the oracular voice. Though strange, it will be sweet to mark the growth of your little boy and the development of Clara's young heart. In the midst of a desert world, we are everything to them, and if we live, it must be our task to make this new mode of life happy to them. At present this is easy, for their childish ideas do not wander into futurity and the stinging craving for sympathy and all of love which our nature is susceptible is not yet awake within them. We cannot guess what will happen then when nature asserts her indefeasible and sacred powers, but long before that time we may all be cold as he who lies in yonder tomb of ice. We need only provide for the present and endeavor to fill with pleasant images the inexperienced fancy of your lovely niece. The scenes which now surround us, vast and sublime as they are, are not such as can best contribute to this work. Nature is here, like our fortunes, grand but too destructive, bare, and rude to be able to afford delight to her young imagination. Let us descend to the sunny plains of Italy. Winter will soon be here to clothe this wilderness in double desolation. But we will cross the bleak hilltops and lead her to scenes of fertility and beauty, where her path will be adorned with flowers and the cheery atmosphere inspire pleasure and hope. In pursuance of this plan, we quitted Chamonix on the following day. We had no cause to hasten our steps. No event was transacted beyond our actual sphere to enchain our resolves, so we yielded to every idle whim and deemed our time well spent when we could behold the passage of the hours without dismay. We loitered along the lovely vale of Servoz, passed long hours on the bridge which, crossing the ravine of Arve, commands a prospect of its pine-clothed depths and the snowy mountains that wall it in. We rambled through romantic Switzerland till, fear of coming winter leading us forward, the first days of October found us in the valley of La Maurienne which leads to Senis. 
I cannot explain the reluctance we felt at leaving this land of mountains. Perhaps it was that we regarded the Alps as boundaries between our former and our future state of existence, and so clung fondly to what of old we had loved. Perhaps because we had now so few impulses urging to a choice between two modes of action, we were pleased to preserve the existence of one, and preferred the prospect of what we were to do to the recollection of what had been done. We felt that for this year danger was past, and we believed that, for some months, we were secured to each other. There was a thrilling, agonizing delight in the thought. It filled the eyes with misty tears. It tore the heart with tumultuous heavings. Frailer than the snowfall in the river were we each and all. But we strove to give life and individuality to the meteoric course of our several existences, and to feel that no moment escaped us unenjoyed. Thus, tottering on the dizzy brink, we were happy. Yes, as we sat beneath the toppling rocks beside the waterfalls near, quote, forests ancient as the hills and folding sunny spots of greenery, end quote, from Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, where the chamois grazed and the timid squirrel laid up its hoard, descanting on the charms of nature, Drinking in the while her unalienable beauties, we were, in an empty world, happy. Yet, O oh, days of joy, days when I spoke to I, and voices sweeter than the music of the swinging branches of the pines or rivulet's gentle murmur, answered mine. Yet, O oh, days replete with beatitude, days of loved society, days unutterably dear to me forlorn. Pass, O oh pass before me, making me in your memory forget what I am. Behold how my streaming eyes blot this senseless paper. Behold how my features are convulsed by agonizing throes at your mere recollection, now that, alone, my tears flow my lips quiver, my cries fill the air, unseen, unmarked, unheard. Yet, O oh yet, days of delight, let me dwell on your long-drawn hours. As the cold increased upon us, we passed the Alps and descended into Italy. At the uprising of morn, we sat at our repast, and cheated our regrets by gay sallies or learned disquisitions. The livelong day we sauntered on, still keeping in view the end of our journey, but careless of the hour of its completion. As the evening star shone out, and the orange sunset far in the west marked the position of the dear land we had forever left, talk, Thought enchaining made the hours fly. Oh, that we had lived thus for ever and for ever! Of what consequence was it to our four hearts that they alone were the fountains of life in the wide world? As far as mere individual sentiment was concerned, we had rather be left thus united together than if, each alone in a populous desert of unknown men, we had wandered truly companionless till life's last term. In this manner we endeavored to console each other. In this manner true philosophy taught us to reason. It was the delight of Adrian and myself to wait on Clara, naming her the little queen of the world, ourselves her humblest servitors. When we arrived at a town, our first care was to select for her its most choice abode. 
to make sure that no harrowing relic remained of its former inhabitants, to seek food for her and minister to her wants with assiduous tenderness. Clara entered into our scheme with childish gaiety. Her chief business was to attend on Evelyn, but it was her sport to array herself in splendid robes, adorn herself with sunny gems, and ape a princely state. Her religion, deep and pure, did not teach her to refuse to blunt thus the keen sting of regret. Her youthful vivacity made her enter, heart and soul, into these strange masquerades. We had resolved to pass the ensuing winter at Milan, which, as being a large and luxurious city, would afford us choice of homes. We had descended the Alps and left far behind their vast forests and mighty crags. We entered smiling Italy. Mingled grass and corn grew in her plains. The unpruned vines threw their luxuriant branches around the elms. The grapes, overripe, had fallen on the ground, or hung purple or burnished green among the red and yellow leaves. The ears of standing corn winnowed to emptiness by the spendthrift winds, the fallen foliage of the trees, the weed-grown brooks, the dusky olive now spotted with its blackened fruit, the chestnuts to which the squirrel only was harvestman. All plenty, and yet, alas, all poverty, painted in wondrous hues and fantastic groupings this land of beauty. In the towns, in the voiceless towns, we visited the churches, adorned by pictures, masterpieces of art, or galleries of statues, while in this genial clime the animals, in new-found liberty, rambled through the gorgeous palaces and hardly feared our forgotten aspect. The dove-colored oxen turned their full eyes on us and paced slowly by. A startling throng of silly sheep, with pattering feet, would start up in some chamber, formerly dedicated to the repose of beauty, and rush, huddling past us, down the marble staircase into the street, and again in at the first open door, taking unrebuked possession of hallowed sanctuary or kingly council chamber. We no longer started at these occurrences, nor at worse exhibition of change, when the palace had become a mere tomb, pregnant with fetid stench, strewn with the dead, and we could perceive how pestilence and fear had played strange antics, chasing the luxurious dame to the dank fields and bare cottage, gathering among wool carpets and beds of silk the rough peasant or the deformed shape of the wretched beggar. We arrived at Milan and stationed ourselves in the Viceroy's palace. Here we made laws for ourselves, dividing our day and fixing distinct occupations for each hour. In the morning we rode in the adjoining country, or wandered through the palaces in search of pictures or antiquities. In the evening we assembled to read or to converse. There were few books that we dared read, few that did not cruelly deface the painting we bestowed on our solitude by recalling combinations and emotions never more to be experienced by us. Metaphysical disquisition, fiction which, wandering from all reality, lost itself in self-created errors, poets of times so far gone by that to read of them was as to read of Atlantis and Utopia, or such as referred to nature only and the workings of one particular mind. But most of all, talk, varied and ever new, beguiled our hours. While we paused thus in our onward career towards death, 
time held on its accustomed course. Still and forever did the earth roll on, enthroned in her atmospheric car, speeded by the force of the invisible coursers of never-erring necessity. And now, this dewdrop in the sky, this ball, ponderous with mountains, lucent with waves, passing from the short tyranny of watery Pisces and the frigid ram, entered the radiant domain of Taurus and the twins. There, fanned by vernal airs, the spirit of beauty sprung from her cold repose, and, with winnowing wings and soft pacing feet, set a girdle of verdure around the earth, sporting among the violets, hiding within the springing foliage of the trees, tripping lightly down the radiant streams into the sunny deep. Quote, For lo, winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. End quote from Solomon's Song Thus was it in the time of the ancient regal poet, thus was it now. Yet how could we, miserable, hail the approach of this delightful season? We hoped indeed that death did not now as heretofore walk in its shadow, yet, left as we were alone to each other, we looked in each other's faces with inquiring eyes, not daring altogether to trust to our presentiments, and endeavoring to divine which would be the hapless survivor to the other three. We were to pass the summer at the Lake of Como, and thither we removed as soon as spring grew to her maturity and the snow disappeared from the hilltops. Ten miles from Como, under the steep heights of the eastern mountains, by the margin of the lake, was a villa called the Pliniana, from its being built on the site of a fountain whose periodical ebb and flow is described by the younger Pliny in his letters. The house had nearly fallen into ruin till, in the year 2090, an English nobleman had bought it and fitted it up with every luxury. Two large halls, hung with splendid tapestry and paved with marble, opened on each side of a court, of whose two other sides one overlooked the deep dark lake, and the other was bounded by a mountain, from whose stony side gushed, with roar and splash, the celebrated fountain. Above, under wood of myrtle and tufts of odorous plants crowned the rock, while the star-pointing giant cypresses reared themselves in the blue air, and the recesses of the hills were adorned with the luxuriant growth of chestnut trees. Here we fixed our summer residence. We had a lovely skiff in which we sailed, now stemming the midmost waves, now coasting the overhanging and craggy banks, thick sown with evergreens, which dipped their shining leaves in the waters and were mirrored in many a little bay and creek of waters of translucent darkness. Here orange plants bloomed. Here birds poured forth melodious hymns, and here, during spring, the cold snake emerged from the clefts and basked on the sunny terraces of rock. Were we not happy in this paradisiacal retreat? If some kind spirit had whispered forgetfulness to us, methinks we should have been happy here, where the precipitous mountains, nearly pathless, shut from our view the far fields of desolate earth, and with small exertion of the imagination we might fancy that the cities were still resonant with popular hum, and the peasant still guided his plough through the furrow, and that we, 
the world's free denizens, enjoyed a voluntary exile, and not a remedy less cutting off from our extinct species. Not one among us enjoyed the beauty of this scenery so much as Clara. Before we quitted Milan, a change had taken place in her habits and manners. She lost her gaiety, she laid aside her sports, and assumed an almost vestal plainness of attire. She shunned us, retiring with Evelyn to some distant chamber or silent nook, nor did she enter into his pastimes with the same zest as she was wont, but would sit and watch him with sadly tender smiles and eyes bright with tears, yet without a word of complaint. She approached us timidly, avoided our caresses, nor shook off her embarrassment till some serious discussion or lofty theme called her for a while out of herself. Her beauty grew as a rose which, opening to the summer wind, discloses leaf after leaf till the sense aches with its excess of loveliness. A slight and variable color tinged her cheeks, and her motions seemed attuned by some hidden harmony of surpassing sweetness. We redoubled our tenderness and earnest attentions. She received them with grateful smiles that fled swift as sunny beam from a glittering wave on an April day. Our only acknowledged point of sympathy with her appeared to be Evelyn. This dear little fellow was a comforter and delight to us beyond all words. His buoyant spirit and his innocent ignorance of our vast calamity were balm to us, whose thoughts and feelings were overwrought and spun out in the immensity of speculative sorrow. To cherish, to caress, to amuse him was the common task of all. Clara, who felt towards him in some degree like a young mother, gratefully acknowledged our kindness towards him. To me, oh, to me, who saw the clear brows and soft eyes of the beloved of my heart, my lost and ever dear Idris, reborn in his gentle face, to me he was dear even to pain. If I pressed him to my heart, Methought I clasped a real and living part of her who had lain there through long years of youthful happiness. It was the custom of Adrian and myself to go out each day in our skiff to forage in the adjacent country. In these expeditions we were seldom accompanied by Clara or her little charge, but our return was an hour of hilarity. Evelyn ransacked our stores with childish eagerness, and we always brought some new-found gift for our fair companion. Then, too, we made discoveries of lovely scenes or gay palaces, whither in the evening we all proceeded. Our sailing expeditions were most divine, and with a fair wind or transverse course we cut the liquid waves. And, if talk failed under the pressure of thought, I had my clarinet with me, which awoke the echoes and gave the change to our careful minds. Clara at such times often returned to her former habits of free converse and gay sally, and though our four hearts alone beat in the world, those four hearts were happy. One day, on our return from the town of Como with a laden boat, we expected, as usual, to be met at the port by Clara and Evelyn, and we were somewhat surprised to see the beach vacant. I, as my nature prompted, would not prognosticate evil, but explained it away as a mere casual incident. Not so, Adrian. He was seized with sudden trembling and apprehension, and he called to me with vehemence to steer quickly for land, and, when near, leapt from the boat, half falling into the water, 
and, scrambling up the bank, hastened along the narrow strip of garden, the only level space between the lake and the mountain. I followed without delay. The garden and inner court were empty. So was the house, whose every room we visited. Adrian called loudly upon Clara's name and was about to rush up the near mountain path when the door of a summer house at the end of the garden slowly opened and Clara appeared. Not advancing towards us, but leaning against a column of the building with blanched cheeks, in a posture of utter despondency. Adrian sprang towards her with a cry of joy and folded her delightedly in his arms. She withdrew from his embrace and, without a word, again entered the summer house. Her quivering lips, her despairing heart, refused to afford her voice to express our misfortune. Poor little Evelyn had, while playing with her, been seized with sudden fever and now lay torpid and speechless on a little couch in the summer house. For a whole fortnight we unceasingly watched beside the poor child as his life declined under the ravages of a virulent typhus. His little form and tiny lineaments encaged the embryo of the world-spanning mind of man. Man's nature, brimful of passions and affections, would have had a home in that little heart, whose swift pulsations hurried towards their close. His small hand's fine mechanism, now flaccid and unbent, would in the growth of sinew and muscle have achieved works of beauty or of strength. His tender rosy feet would have trod in firm manhood the bowers and glades of earth. These reflections were now of little use. He lay, thought and strength suspended, waiting, unresisting, the final blow. We watched at his bedside, and when the excess of fever was on him, we neither spoke nor looked at each other, marking only his obstructed breath and the mortal glow that tinged his sunken cheek, the heavy death that weighed on his eyelids. It is a trite evasion to say that words could not express our long-drawn agony. Yet how can words image sensations whose tormenting keenness throw us back, as it were, on the deep roots and hidden foundations of our nature, which shake our being with earthquake throw, so that we leave to confide in accustomed feelings which, like Mother Earth, support us, and cling to some vain imagination or deceitful hope, which will soon be buried in the ruins occasioned by the final shock. I have called that period a fortnight, which we passed watching the changes of the sweet child's malady, and such it might have been. At night we wondered to find another day gone, while each particular hour seemed endless. Day and night were exchanged for one another uncounted. We slept hardly at all, nor did we even quit his room except when a pang of grief seized us and we retired from each other for a short period to conceal our sobs and tears. We endeavored in vain to abstract Clara from this deplorable scene. She sat, hour after hour, looking at him, now softly arranging his pillow, and, while he had power to swallow, administered his drink. At length the moment of his death came. The blood paused in its flow. His eyes opened, and then closed again. Without convulsion or sigh, the frail tenement was left vacant of its spiritual inhabitant. I have heard that the sight of the dead has confirmed materialists in their belief. I ever felt otherwise. Was that my child, that moveless, decaying inanimation? 
My child was enraptured by my caresses. His dear voice, clothed with meaning articulations, his thoughts otherwise inaccessible. His smile was a ray of the soul, and the same soul sat upon its throne in his eyes. I turn from this mockery of what he was. Take, O earth, thy debt. Freely and forever I consign to thee the garb thou didst afford. But thou, sweet child, amiable and beloved boy, either thy spirit has sought a fitter dwelling, or, shrined in my heart, thou livest while it lives. We placed his remains under a cypress, the upright mountain being scooped out to receive them. And then Clara said, If you wish me to live, take me from hence. There is something in this scene of transcendent beauty, in these trees and hills and waves, that forever whisper to me, Leave thy cumbrous flesh and make a part of us. I earnestly entreat you to take me away. So on the 15th of August, we bade adieu to our villa and the embowering shades of this abode of beauty, to calm bay and noisy waterfall, to Evelyn's little grave we bade farewell, and then, with heavy hearts, we departed on our pilgrimage towards Rome. Stay tuned for the next segment from The Last Man by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced, edited, and hosted by me, Sarah Van Zaley. A big thank you to Project Gutenberg for helping me find many interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams. <laughs>